Hello everyone, I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Today we're going to have the great opportunity to speak with Dr. Daniel Amen. Uh, I've had the opportunity to actually uh, share the stage with Dr. Amen on multiple occasions at various medical venues. Uh, he's a terrific speaker and a terrific teacher. He is a double uh, board certified adult and child psychiatrist and a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, you may well know that he's the medical director of the Amen Clinics, which are in uh, Newport Beach, California, uh, Fairfield, California, and also in Bellevue, Washington, as well as uh, Reston, Virginia. The Amen Clinics, under his direction, have the largest database of what are called functional brain scans, and we're going to look into what that exactly means, that relate to more than 60,000 scans that he and his facilities have performed. He is the Assistant Clinical Professor of Psychiatry and Human Behavior at the University of California in Irvine at their School of Medicine, and he has presented his work around the world. Uh, he's largely regarded, widely regarded as being uh, not only a gifted teacher, uh, but really um, a real pioneer in the application of this incredible science of brain imaging uh, in terms of leveraging that information for ideas that are actionable. Um, what Dr. Amen is able to do, which is really so admirable, is he can take very complex information and make it really very understandable and even more importantly make it actionable. He is the lead researcher in the world's largest brain imaging brain rehabilitation study uh, that's being done on professional football players and this is not only demonstrating significant brain damage in a high percentage of retired uh, professional uh, football players, but also the possibility for rehabilitation and has uh, talked about cases uh, in his various lectures. He is the author of 40 professional articles and three New York Times bestsellers, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, Magnificent Mind at Any Age, and Change Your Brain, Change Your Body. Uh, he is also the author of Healing ADD, Making a Good Brain Great, Healing the Hardware of the Soul, and co-author of Unchain Your Brain, Healing Anxiety and Depression, and Preventing Alzheimer's. Uh, Dr. Amen's work has been featured in Newsweek, Parade Magazine, New York Times Magazine, Men's Health, and Cosmopolitan. And what we're going to be looking at today and talking about, in addition to his many other things that he does, is his book, Change Your Brain, uh, Change Your Life, uh, which has been redone, and we're going to be looking at uh, the new version of this really exciting uh, book. So uh, let's not delay any further and jump right into our interview. So welcome, Dr. Amen. Thanks, David. So nice to see you. And it uh, in the intro, I was talking about all of your incredible accomplishments, how uh, mesmerized we all are when we have the opportunity to hear you speak at professional venues. And you've reissued your, your book, uh, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, a terrific book to start off with, made some changes. But let's take a step back and, and just talk about what you do, because, you know, you're really a real leading force in our understanding about things brain related. And I think really the niche that you've cultivated is this application of really high levels of technology, but making that information really actionable by people. So tell us what is the typical approach that you might use in dealing with a, uh, an individual who comes to see you? So most psychiatrists, it's a symptom-based uh, profession. You have six out of these nine symptoms for depression and you get a diagnosis of depression. And then they're off to the races treating your depression. And no other specialty in medicine acts like that. So what we do at Amen Clinics is, yes, we take very detailed histories, but we also image you because how do I know what's going on in your brain unless I actually look? So one of the things we've been doing this for 25 years, we found that, for example, depression is not one thing in the brain. Some people have overactive brains and you need to calm them down where other people have underactive brain. So we take these really great histories, then we image people. We use a study called SPECT. SPECT looks at blood flow and activity. It looks at how your brain 
works. It's different than a CAT scan or an MRI, which are anatomy studies. At least in psychiatry, most of the problems are not anatomical, they're functional. And then together with that information, we make more targeted, uh, more specific diagnoses so we can target treatment, not to a general cluster of symptoms like ADD, bipolar disorder, autism, but to how your individual brain works. And it's really through imaging that I realized some of the medications I was taught to use are just flat out toxic for brain function. (laughs) And it led us to more natural ways to heal the brain. You know, I I always love listening to you because you're just masterful in teaching us about diet and gut health. And uh, I mean, you know, who would have thought? But when I first started imaging people, I had some of my patients on benzos and they were just toxic to brain function. And now 25 years later, there are all these studies coming out that say, if you take benzos in middle age, you're more likely to get dementia. And, but, but the big point of this book, I mean, I wrote it 18 years ago and so much has changed in my life. And we had about 5,000 scans we'd done in 1998. Now we've done 115,000 scans. I mean, the, the learning just continues at at an accelerated, exciting pace. I mean, who knew Lyme is a major cause of psychiatric disorder or concussion. I I definitely want to come back to that, but you know, just as a very broad stroke, we've, we've often heard that it's more important to know the person who has the disease than the disease the person has. And I think you've taken that statement to a, a really sophisticated level in terms of technology in trying to learn as much as you can about what makes that person unique. And, and you use that information, which is so cool, in, in ways to cultivate a very specific uh, remedy program, a very specific way of unraveling those issues that define that individual, as opposed to being a doctor who treats depression or who treats um, this traumatic encephalopathy that, you know, I know that you're at the forefront of, of exploring. So, so that said, you've learned a lot since the book was originally published, and obviously that went into some, uh, it went into the, the revised edition, and we're going to learn all about that. But how incredible it, it seems that you've kind of, may I say, broken ranks with mainstream psychiatry, and I'm, that's a compliment, uh, in terms of looking at other factors, looking at lifestyle factors, looking at nutrition, sleep, and exercise. What does the mainstream of psychiatry say about Daniel Amen? Um well, some people love me. I just talked to... I'm uh, one of those people. Just say, so, you're the best. I just <laughs> talked to the past president of the APA, and I'm like, hey, does everybody hate me? Because there are some <laughs> vocal haters. And he's like, no, everybody's curious. So there's a, a level of curiosity. And then um, there are people who just hate me. Because I, I often say psychiatrists are the only medical doctors who virtually never look at the organ they treat. And because of that, they hurt people. And um, so that doesn't get you friends when uh, you say the emperor has no clothes. But I'm very concerned uh, the incidence of depression has gone up 400% since 1987, the year Prozac was released. It's like, well, why would that be if Prozac is this incredible uh, drug? I'm concerned. And, you know, since you and I have been physicians, medicine has changed. It used to be doctors would have 20 or 30 minutes with their patients, and now they have five or six. And people often leave their doctor's office with a prescription for an antidepressant, an anti-anxiety drug, a sleep medication. And no one's looked. And these medicines are toxic to the wrong people. Now, I'm not opposed to medicine. I use them. I'm a huge fan when they're used in a targeted fashion. But I've seen way too many people be hurt with psychiatric medications. And it's because people are prescribing them in the dark. So I think, you know, the real point here is that in our society, if you ask a physician in general, how do you treat depression, he or she is going to list the medications that are used. And it's not that you reject the idea of using medications, but that's treating symptoms as perhaps an adjunct, but it really, according to you, and I would agree with you, doesn't get to the root of the problem. Well, n- not at all. And, you know, the exciting thing about imaging, and 
perhaps so one of the irritating things about imaging is uh, you have to know so much more. So, for example, if I have one, uh, I, I had a depressed patient recently, and his brain looked toxic. I mean, it looked like he was an alcoholic, except he didn't drink and he didn't do drugs. And so, for me, that's not about, well, let me prescribe this or that. It's let me find out why your brain is toxic. And it turned out he had uh, mold in his house. And we know mold is a neurotoxin. And you know, I mean, why is the psychiatrist asking you, have you ever had a flood in your house? Because uh, we've just learned that things like environmental toxins, uh, infections uh, are a major cause of psychiatric illness. But because most psychiatrists never look at the brain, they don't know that there's more to be done to work up these patients who are suffering. You know, um, depression is now looked upon as representing a manifestation of systemic inflammation, uh, a manifestation of sickness behavior. And I think that, you know, that was a really good segue. You're talking about a patient with mold exposure. And I think you indicated earlier that you're seeing a lot of Lyme disease. What's going on with that? Well, it's actually horrifying. And there's a, a map that I put in uh, the new book, where it looks at the highest incidence of schizophrenia in the United States. So it's the Northeast, the North Midwest, and the West Coast. And then if you overlay the highest incidence of Lyme, they're identical maps uh, that, I mean, we've known forever that syphilis can cause psychiatric problems, uh, including depression and including dementia. Well, Lyme is a spirochete and uh, it's not just a Connecticut disorder. It's rampant on the East Coast, and now we know it's rampant on the West Coast. I, I tell, tell the story in the book about Adriana, a 16-year-old beautiful girl, goes on vacation to Yosemite, normal, high-functioning, great family. And 10 days later, um, she's hallucinating. She's aggressive. They put her in a psychiatric hospital. Um, and six months later, Adriana is a shell of herself, uh, failed multiple antipsychotic medications. She comes to see us and her brain's working way too hard. And we go, her brain has inflammation. Why? And when we work her up, she has Lyme. In fact, when they went to Yosemite, they were surrounded by six deer and they actually thought it was a magical moment, but it was the beginning of destruction for this poor girl. And on a series of antibiotics, she got her life back. Uh, I mean, it's so exciting. She spent last year in Europe. She's graduating from Pepperdine this year. But if I would have just treated her like she was a schizophrenic person or a psychosis of, you know, not otherwise specified, which is sort of a wastebasket term, then, I, you know, her life would have been a living hell. Uh, we have to use the tools we have to look, to investigate, to understand, uh, because inflammation, you know, comes from the Latin word for fire. And it's like you have a low level fire in your body destroying your organs. So finding out the source of inflammation and then, you know, having people on anti-inflammatory programs. So really what you're saying is you're paying attention to that fire and that for the most part, she would have been treated only with attention to the smoke. In other words, the manifestations of the underlying event or, or illness, the Lyme disease, which were her psychiatric issues, they would have been treated aggressively with antipsychotics. And uh, she probably would have been institutionalized because they would have neglected looking at the underlying problem. Right. I really like how, how you phrase that. Uh, well, only you know, one of the things I'd like to uh, just call attention to is this notion of uh, you mentioned her brain was uh, on your imaging studies was found to be hyperactive, basically in overdrive. And, and what we know about the Lyme organism is it is specifically toxic to mitochondrial function. The energy production ability of cells is dramatically compromised when Lyme is present. And therefore, what happens, especially in brain cells, is they have to work extra hard to keep uh, action going, to keep their function going. They're going down the road at 60 miles an hour, but they haven't upshifted from, from first or second gear. So they're really, really burning through uh, metabolic fuel, creating all the byproducts of metabolism, profound uh, overproduction of free radicals leading to damage to tissue, 
and uh, how incredible that you were a actually able to visualize that and then really direct appropriate care. So here's a woman who comes to a psychiatrist and is diagnosed with Lyme disease because you dug deep. Well, and that's what the imaging has taught me. And, you know, I always say, you know, pictures worth a thousand words, but a map is worth a thousand pictures. A map tells you where you are and gives you directions on how to get to where you want to go. Oh, and unfortunately, that. psychiatrists are a profession that work without the map. And it then gets us into this crazy system of 15 minute med checks, try this, try that, you know, I'll give you this medicine and then this medicine to handle the side effect of that medicine. And we're not getting underneath to see what's really causing the unhappiness that we, we are experiencing. And, you know, I mean, just for example, we did a study with Bill Phillips, a famous bodybuilder on um, the effect of diet on, on the brain. So we scanned people after they had a really bad meal, and then again after a really good meal. And we saw the health of the brain respond very quickly to what you eat. I mean, people don't really think that the brain's the most energy-hungry organ in the body, and it uses 20 to 30% of the calories you consume. So if you have a fast food, pro-inflammatory diet, you're going to have a fast food mind and all the bad things that go with that. Um, let me just <clears throat> change uh, speed here a little bit because I don't want to forget to to have a bit of a discussion about uh, these issues with uh, chronic um, post-traumatic encephalopathy that we're seeing so much of. Uh, certainly the professional football players have, have taken a lot of our attention, but uh, I, I think you'd agree that we're seeing this even uh, in, uh, as a result of uh, mild uh, head injuries in high school soccer players, uh, in all kinds of individuals. So, you know, the brain is extremely delicate. What are the kinds of findings that you're observing with respect to the imaging studies in individuals who've had head trauma? So I learned this a long time ago, a long time before we did our big NFL study. So Amon Clinics did the world's first and largest study on active and retired NFL players. And we started in 2008. But almost as soon as I started imaging, uh, I began to realize that mild traumatic brain injury, and I hate that term, it's a bad term term because when you actually look at the scans, there's nothing mild uh, about the damage that we see. In fact, I'll tell you a story. I used to write a column for the local newspaper where I lived in Northern California, and I wrote a column on head injury and depression, and I got a call late one night from a mother who was just hysterically crying, and she said, two years ago, my son had a concussion. He went over the handlebars on his bicycle and, you know, his front tire hit the corner of a curb and he flew over onto his head. And she said he was a straight A student. He was a good kid. He was a loving son. And then he just became mean. He was sad. He was explosive. And two weeks before she read my column, he'd shot and killed himself. And she was just so um, unhappy and and it just made me cry because there's so many people who have um, what people link, you know, called mild traumatic brain injury, lost consciousness for like 30 minutes. And people called it mild, but my experience, it would have devastated probably the left hemisphere, which is involved with mood regulation, temper control, learning. And what, what people don't know is you can rehabilitate brain trauma. I mean, it's what we demonstrated in our big NFL study is you are not stuck with the brain you have. You can make it better. But one of the big lessons, I don't know if you've had this experience, is we see evidence of traumatic brain injuries on scans. And we go, well, have you ever had a brain injury? I mean, we ask that to everybody, but we don't ask them once. You have to ask them like 10 times. Yeah. And I remember the first time it was no, no, no. And then I went, well, did you ever fall out of a tree or off a fence or dive into a shallow pool or have a concussion playing sports or be in a car accident? And the guy went, and this is after he said no 10 times. He said, well, when I was seven years old, I fell out of a second story window. Do you think that counts? And I'm like, well, maybe. And I think much of psychiatry, you know, a significant percentage of psychiatry is really dealing with the fallout of brain injuries that no one has taken seriously. 
Well, you know, uh, it, it's true. You, you have to dig deep. And I think one of the things that we've uh, noted, and I think it's in the literature as well, is that these events, even though they're no longer occurring, create a what's called a feed-forward cycle, where the, the focal areas of inflammation and vascular change actually kindle uh, in the sense of making the areas surrounding them even continue to deteriorate. So it really sets into motion this feed-forward process where the brain and its inflammation actually exacerbates over time, even though they're now retired and presumably not... Uh, not banging their heads anymore, sitting at home and watching games on TV, but still getting worse with time. And I think you made an extremely important point, and it deals with the brain's ability to heal itself. And, you know, I am certain when, when you were in medical school, I know it was that way with me, that we were told the brain could never heal. The brain does, it totally lacks plasticity. And uh, even this notion of growing new brain cells, neurogenesis, was never talked about because it wasn't believed because we didn't have the studies that would demonstrate that. But this is a brave new world now, isn't it, with respect to the brain being able to heal itself? So with our NFL study, you know, I often say, you know, you can change your brain and I can prove it. And with our big NFL study, so 96% of our players, we have almost 200 now, showed high levels of brain damage. And when we put them on a rehabilitation program, which is very specific, 80% of them showed improvement in as little as two months. I mean, so we're so excited, but it starts with assessment. If you don't look, you don't know, stop lying about it. So we, <laughs> you have so a, we, a chapter in your book called, uh, uh, you can't change what you cannot measure. And I like that because, um, you have to have the data. I mean, it's certainly unusual to be having a discussion with a psychiatrist about quantifiable data, not just the brain imaging, but blood studies, etc. That's not something you would typically see in a psychiatric uh, encounter, in an encounter with a psychiatrist uh, about a patient and his or her illness. Yeah, except it's good medicine. You know, it's in all of our textbooks. If uh, And now, I mean, inflammation is really a major part of what we're seeing in our research studies. So if your C-reactive protein is high, you're more likely to get dementia and you're more likely to be depressed. If your thyroid's not right, you're not going to get better. And we've known forever that thyroid's actually a treatment for resistant depression. So, you know, I don't think of myself on the edge of good medicine. I think what we do is good medicine. And, you know, I just, we just look and it's a business principle, right? You can't change what you don't measure. And I think that's exactly right. And one of the things we measure is weight, waste to height ratio. Uh, cause BMI body mass index doesn't really work in the football players cause they're so big and strong, but your waist should be half your height or less. Otherwise, it's causing metabolic problems in your body. And we published two studies. Uh, I call it the dinosaur syndrome. As your weight goes up, the size and function of your brain goes down, which should scare the fat off anyone. It's the biggest brain drain. Think of this, Dave. It's the biggest brain drain in the history of the United States with two thirds of us overweight, one third of us obese. It's actually become a national security crisis because people trying to join the military, they don't take 70% of them because they're unhealthy. And then you probably read this new study that was in JAMA, it just horrified me. 50% of the population population is diabetic or pre-diabetic. So if you think of diabetes, obesity, um, brain damage, there's trouble coming for our society if we don't get serious uh, about our health. And uh, again, just for our viewers, recognize what Dr. Amen has just said, and that is this profound correlation between this process of inflammation that we, we will get our arms around the fact that that's a process involved in things like coronary artery disease, certainly common inflammatory disorders of the skin and the joints. But now to extend that to brain-related issues uh, like depression. I mean, the literature on Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, and autism has been out there. We've talked about it. But depression is looked upon as an inflammatory situation that you know may really have its origin in terms of gut permeability and changes in the gut bacteria 
that now you are able to, to, to see in terms of looking at brain scans, the manifestations of changes in the gut bacteria as revealed in images of the brain. You know, we all grew up at a time when the brain and depression and Alzheimer's were in one place and the heart and the gut were in another place. And this notion of the body being separate individual reductionist parts, but what a beautiful thing it is that you've created where you're bringing us back to reality and recognizing that things gut related. Lifestyle choices have a huge role to play, not just in mood, but in terms of your ability to see that in, in your scans and more importantly, see them change when people implement the kind of programs that you're describing. Well, it's so exciting. I mean, just the notion you're not stuck with the brain you have, you can make it better. Uh, I mean, that's motivating. And, you know, I just turned 61 and I know aging is coming for me, right? I've seen tens of thousands of scans, little kids' brains, really busy, beautiful, older people's brains, shrunken, atrophy, uh, but it doesn't have to. So that's the exciting thing but you have to be serious. And in the book, I actually introduce a brand new concept that I've been working on with my wife called the brain warriors way, uh, that you're in a war for the health of your brain. Everywhere you go, someone's trying to shove bad food down your throat, a toxic thought in your head, a gadget that will steal your attention. You know, the human attention span now is eight seconds. This is a study from Microsoft. A goldfish is nine seconds. This is evolution going the wrong way. So you have to be focused. Wait, what did you just say? Our... I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> It's it's just crazy when when you think of it. Our attention span in the year 2000 was 12 seconds. So we've lost 30% of our attention span in just 15 years because of the constant bombardment of gadgets. Yeah, I mean that's that's a consequence of the of the world that we live in. Um it may come as a surprise to some that here you are a psychiatrist but you're all over uh, the notion that aerobic exercise is a critical player as a lifestyle choice choice for a better functioning brain. Can you tell us about that? It, well, head-to-head -head studies with antidepressants, uh, with Zola, for example, which is an antidepressant I like for the right brain. Um, walking like you're late, 45 minutes, four times a week, was equally effective at 12 weeks. At 10 months, exercise was more effective. And, you know, when you exercise, you're really improving the overall vasculature in your body. And, you know, because SPECT is a blood flow study, the imaging study we use. And I'm like, it's all about blood flow. I used to say, whatever's good for your heart is good for your brain. And whatever's bad for your heart is bad for your brain. And then a couple of years ago, I wrote The Brain in Love and I realized I had to expand the territory a little bit. Whatever's good for your heart is good for your brain is good for your genitals. It's all about blood flow. Whatever's bad for your heart is bad for your brain, bad for your genitals. So you, you have to figure out- a lot out. more attention with that. <laughs> well, 40% of 40 year olds, according to a study from Harvard, have erectile dysfunction, which means 40% of 40 year olds have brain dysfunction. And, you know, you and I both see a lot of people, they're in their 40s and they go, my memory's no good. Well, that's normal because I'm in my 40s. And I'm like, no, you have bad habits. And they say, well, I'm 50 and my memory's no good. That's normal. And I'm like, no, it's because you have bad habits. You know, maybe typical, but it's not normal no matter what your age. Um, let me just uh, take a, a little bit of a stretch here uh, for the uh, healthcare providers who are watching this video. And uh, Dr. Amon said something that was really very profound, and that is that the effectiveness of aerobic exercise actually rivals the, the uh, effectiveness of the SSRI, several of the SSRI antidepressants. And I think it's very interesting uh, to look at the literature that demonstrates that the effectiveness, at least in laboratory animals, of depression of the SSRI medications depends on the growth of new brain cells, it depends on neurogenesis, which is mediated by what we call brain derived neurotrophic factor. And the best way to amp up BDNF is aerobic exercise to grow new brain cells and to work on that pathway, that CREB mediated pathway in the hippocampus that allows you to grow new brain cells. So, again, you know, mechanistically, there's some real good science that totally supports what you've just said. But you've also alluded to, um, to love and compassion. And you, know, you actually, in your book, talk about these four circles, uh, the psych biological, psychological, social, and spiritual. 
And um, is it off the table that a psychiatrist should be talking about spiritual pursuits? <laughs> well, you know, Freud sort of messed it up for us because uh, he was an atheist. You know, most people don't know he is also a cocaine addict. Uh, you know, he not only gave us a brainless psychiatry, he gave us a godless psychiatry. And whenever I evaluate someone, I'm always looking at, well, what's the biology? What are their genes, their family history, their diet, their exercise? Have they been exposed to head trauma, toxins? Uh, well, what are the psychological issues? What did they grow up in? What are the messages they have? Do they have past successes, past failures, past trauma that I have to deal with. There's also a huge social circle, which I become more impressed with every day. You become like the people you hang out with. Your health habits are, you know, determined in large part by who you spend time with. But there's also a spiritual circle. And Viktor Frankl was masterful at describing this in his book, Man's Search for Meaning. It's people who have a deep level of meaning and purpose actually live 15% longer. So I want to know your connection with the planet, your connection with the past, my grandfather, your connection with the future, my grandbabies, and your connection with God as you see God. I think this is just a critical part of being human. And uh, to just ignore it or throw it out like many psychiatrists did is just wrong because it doesn't really help you understand the human experience. And then the interventions are biopsychosocial spiritual. So whether it's diet, exercise, supplements, medication, hyperbaric oxygen, neurofeedback, you know, there are lots of wonderful biological treatments. There's also psychological treatments, meditation, hypnosis, cognitive therapy, uh, therapy for past trauma, social treatments, getting people to volunteer, getting them uh, to be connected with healthy people. And there's spiritual treatments. You know, why do you care? Let's write out your deepest sense of meaning and purpose and have you meditate on that. And I just find for me, and we have the highest success rates of anybody that publishes them. I mean, we're really excited. We do a formal outcome study on every patient we see at the six clinics we have. And we see complicated people, I'm sure like you, um, on average, they have 4.2 diagnoses. Complicated like me or like I see? Complicated like <laughs> the patients I send you because okay. I send you patients and I only I'm send... complicated though. I'll clue you. <laughs> yeah. Great right. Time. I mean, that we see complicated people, but at the end of six months on treatment resistant people, 75% are better across all measures. And if we actually do the treatment, it's 84%. So we're really excited. But I think it's this four circle model, biological, psychological, social, spiritual, informed by imaging using the least toxic, most effective treatments. You know, as you were going through that description, I was thinking about the work done in the so-called blue zones. And I think the part that really uh, people tend to brush under the carpet of uh, the blue zone outcomes uh, uh, are, you know, most people seem to be focused on, well, what is the diet that they are consuming in, in this area versus that area? Uh, what is it about uh, the people in Okinawa in terms of their diet and perhaps their physical activity that's conferring upon them longevity? And, you know, the actual book itself talks about their social connectedness, their sense of, uh, of need and being needed, and that that likely is playing an important role. And I think if you need to reduce that to changes in neurochemistry, then so be it. I mean, if I'm certain that in those individuals, if you were to measure their uh, cortisol levels as well as their cortisol responses to an imparted stress, you'd see significant differences in comparison to age match population living in stressful America. So I think there's a lot to what you said in looking at your patients from such a broad perspective, and even more importantly, how you are able to leverage this information once you gain that perspective in terms of what you have been unique in, in accomplishing, and that is creating programs that work uh, far more uh, aggressively than any pharmaceutical-based uh, intervention program. Without side effects. I mean, that's sort of the exciting thing, you know, first do no harm is one of the first things that medical students learn. And we planted this program in one of the largest churches in America, uh, along with my friend, our friend, Mark Hyman. And it was based on five pillars, faith, food, fitness, 
focus and friends. And what we discovered, I mean, a lot of people know this, is people get better together or they get sick together. And I came to believe and talk about it and change your brain, change your life. The first, you have to get this information and you have to live it because if you don't live the message of your life, quite frankly, you're a bad messenger. And there's just no other way to say that. But once you get it and you live it, you have to teach someone because it is in the act of giving that you receive. And I never sort of really understood that from the prayer of St. Francis, uh, because he said, for it is in the giving that we receive. But then what I realized is if you give away health, if you teach someone how to exercise, how to eat better, how to think better, how to get into their sense of meaning and purpose, you're creating your own support group, making it more likely you'll stay on the program forever. Because, you know, my program, your programs, they're never about losing 10 pounds. If you want to lose 10 pounds and that's all you're interested in, go to Weight Watchers. But if you want to change your brain and your body for the rest of your life, then, you know, that's what you and I really care about is creating lifelong health, uh, which is what I'm just so excited about. Well, let me thank you. And uh, not just for our interview today, but really for all of uh, all you've done over the past decades uh, in terms of really personifying the term doctor, which means teacher. And that is, uh, you you know, you've taught yourself so much, you've learned so much, but you've taken it that step further in your ability to share that uh, with so many through your uh, uh, scientific publications, your books, uh, and not to mention your very, very successful public television uh, programs that have really reached all across this country. So uh, you're doing a, a heck of a job. And again, uh, for our viewers, here's the book. You can get it on Amazon at your local bookstore. It is terrific. And most importantly, it's actionable. Uh, this is a book that you will read and then have answers to these issues that you've wondered about. But most importantly, uh, Dr. Amen takes us through um, what we can do and what are those actionable points. So, gee whiz, thanks again for, for being my guest today, and I hope to see you soon. Well, thank you, David. I've loved your work for a long time. Um, from a professional standpoint, you are just one of the best teachers uh, for our field. And I think the more people learn from you, and they certainly did with Grain Brain and Brain Maker, uh, both books that I love and appreciate. So I'm grateful for your support and uh, for our time today. Oh, great. Thanks, Dan. We'll talk soon. Okay. Well, that was an amazing uh, interview. Uh, Dr. Amen is just at the top of his game. Uh, really able to bring very complex issues to a level of understandability to everyone. And beyond uh, the fact that he makes this seemingly complicated information understandable, he makes, as you have seen, this information actionable. What is it we can do with this information uh, now that he has provided it in terms of being able to actually change our brain from a functional perspective, as he's demonstrated on his uh, imaging studies, uh, as well as a perspective in terms of creating a brain that's uh, more functional, but uh, even more resistant to disease moving forward, basically being healthier. So uh, that was uh, quite an exciting interview. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you soon.